Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Minister's Manor. It's good to see everyone tonight. If you're listening on the internet, we're so glad that you chose to receive from this service tonight. I'm Curtis Crosby. I'm the uh, Director of Ministers of Victory under Curtis and Ministries, and it's a blessing to be a part of this ministry. Amen? Amen? Lord, we love and thank you. We thank you, Father, for calling us into the ministry. We thank you, Lord, for the ministers around the world that, Father, you have called into the ministry. Lord, we pray for them right now, and thank you, Father, for strengthening, strengthening them in their inner man, for refreshing their vision, Father, that, Lord, there would be a fresh fire on the inside of them just to fulfill the calling that you have on their life. And, Father, I thank you they're going to receive everything you have for them tonight. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I'm very, very grateful for Curtis. He uh, went to Peru for me. Um, I guess a couple weeks ago now. I don't remember where I was at. And uh, he's been helping ministers around the world. And I was thinking, it's funny, I was in Texas yesterday and um, I was talking to some ministers and they said, hey, we'd like to come to your minister's conference. We heard you were having a minister's conference. And I said, really? And I said, um, they said, when is it? And I said, well, you know, that's an interesting thing because I was thinking about the one we were planning in Florida, but I didn't know the dates. And they said, well... I said, I, I'm not really sure what, which one, what time the states is in. They said, well, where do you have them? I said, and I stopped for a second, and I thought, you know, this year we're having them in Peru, France, and Australia, and now, actually, Finland, we're going to do a minister's, it's not a conference, but we're going to do a minister's meeting in Finland in a couple of weeks, and I was like, wow, I, I guess we're getting around. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just don't think about it, you, you know, and, uh, but what a tremendous blessing and things. It's good to be with you guys tonight. Uh, Curtis had to fill in for me last time. I'm not exactly sure where I was at, but uh, I thank God for our partners that allow us to be a blessing to people. Amen? Amen. Tonight we're going to get into something that's... Um, I, I was going to continue on about how to get started in ministry, and I'm going to go back to that, really. Uh, but there was something that came up in my heart as I was studying, and, I, and then as the Lord began to expound upon some things... I thought that uh, I, 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 there were certain things I just didn't see it that way. Um, in uh, Romans chapter 2, and uh, we're going to be in uh, round uh, 21. We'll start in 21. Now, it says, You therefore who teach another, which is all of it should really should be all of us. It should be everybody in the body of Christ. Because everybody should be making disciples. Uh, some will have more disciples than others. Some will just be one-on-one. -on -one, but everybody should be making a disciple. Because that's part of our calling. But it says, you who, but in particular, those of us who minister to others, says, there, you therefore teach another, do you not teach yourself? That's an interesting statement. Because a lot of times people study for messages. And we, we covered this kind of, uh, during how to, to get started in ministry. But one of the things that people always ask me is, is you know, well, what do you, what do you, uh, how much time do you take studying a message? Honestly, most of the time, if I'm preaching on something, it's, by, it's because of something I was studying for myself, that I was trying to, I was trying to get deeper into something, um, trying to understand, so it, really, the How to Hear from God conference that we just did. That came out of me wanting to hear from God more accurately than I ever have, and trying to answer some questions of the past of why certain things happen that way. And so, but unfortunately, what happens a lot of time with people is, is um, we, we get caught up in ministering to others that we never take time to make sure we're actually living the messages that we're teaching and that we're teaching ourselves. And, I, you know, all of us, and I, I believe it works for all of the giftings. I know in particular it works for mine and Curtis's gifting, um, works for my wife's gifting as well. I think if you were a pure teacher, it might be a little bit different. But a lot of times, even as we study scriptures and we get ready, uh, I, I was listening to myself teach on grace and faith. I, I just preached two messages somewhere a couple weeks ago, and it was on the internet, and I I decided somebody was asking me about it, so I went back to go listen to it. I thought, wow, this is really good. And then I got to thinking about the fact that 
and I, that's not on me because of what I'm about to say. There's things that come out when you're ministering that you did not know before you started ministering. And they come out of your heart. All of a sudden, you begin to see something in a particular way while you're ministering. And sometimes ministers forget that that's just as much for them as it is for the people they're ministering to. In fact, one of the ways that we, when we do restore ministers, I, for those of you who don't know, we pastor a lot of ministers and pretty much have from the beginning. But one of the things that we do is we try to see ministers restored. And one of the things that we do when we're restoring ministers during the last phase of restoration is, is they have to minister, uh, there's pretty much three separate messages that they have to minister, and they do it to larger and larger crowds as they're getting built back up. They might do it to a few isolated people, and then a little bit bigger, and then finally they do a whole service. And when they do the service, and when they do these services, most of the time the messages I assign them have something to do with the challenges that they've experienced in the past. And we always give them a recording of the messages, and we tell them, okay, now, what you're, we want you to do is, if this comes up or when this comes up again and it seeks to attack you, take the message you minister and allow you to preach your answer to yourself. Because you need to learn, um, you know, years ago when it was easier to record stuff, it's, I guess it's still easier with phones now, but I remember when you could just make a cassette tape and stuff like that. And if you wanted to get something down on the inside of yourself, one of the things I did is I would read a scripture to me. And I would say, Kurt, by the stripes of Jesus, you, Kurt, were healed. And I'd read it to myself, and then I'd listen to it. And then I'd hear me tell me what the Word said. And it, was, it really helped me a lot and, and stuff. So you got to remember when you're teaching, make sure you're learning for yourself. Teach yourself. Apply these things. These are not just to get people excited. These are not just so that people value you. We, we teach these things so that, that we were, one, we were self ought to live. And the second thing is, is that we teach them so that they can be applied, not necessarily just get out there. You understand what I mean? Because sometimes people just talk, and they just keep talking, and, you know, they say a lot of stuff, but people don't walk out of there. Some people can get really excited. They can dance. They can run around. They can do all this stuff, but when the service is over, they have nothing to apply, and it's important that as excited as we get, we got to have something to apply. I remember one time I learned, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. For years ago, there was a, a, the Lord was really moving, and people were laughing, a lot, and they were laughing and falling under the Spirit of God and stuff. And I was in a service with Kenneth Copeland one time, and one night, it was one of those services, and people just started laughing, and they started falling out, and he kind of went with it, and that was wonderful. And then the next night, he gets up there to minister, and people start laughing again, and he said, no, stop, stop. That's not the flow tonight. And they said, that's good, that's good to have. But when that wears off, you're going to need something to live. Let's get into the Scriptures tonight and, t and learn something so that you can have that joy every day. And I thought, mm hmm that is an excellent, excellent balance. Because I had been in services with people where they laughed, they ran, they joyed, they, they shouted, they worshipped, and all this other stuff. Service was over and Monday morning, and there was a problem that hit. And they were not steady. They were not consistent. They didn't walk it out, and it didn't matter that we laughed, we shouted, and we jumped. You need to be able to hold on to it. You, in fact, you need to learn to laugh, shout, and jump when you don't feel it, and there's nobody singing, simply because the word you heard that night was true, and the word is still true today, whether you're feeling it the same way you felt it before. Moving right along. I don't know how I got off on that. You know, a lot of times... Um, I've dealt with a lot of pain in my life. I've dealt with a lot of betrayal. And, and one of the things people ask me is, how do you deal with it? It's just, well, it doesn't change the Word of God. And if it doesn't change the Word of God, I should just remain the same. I'm not, not going to become jaded because of yesterday, because God didn't change, and He's the one I'm living for, not for what other people did. Now, anyway, let's get on. He says this. He says... Um, 
You therefore teach who teach ye others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? I thought that was an interesting one. I'm still meditating on it and stuff, but I think it's funny because it, normally it's not, it's, it's not like do you go buy idols and stuff. It's do you rob temples? And there's an implication in here, if you think about it, in giving, and will a man rob God if you ride me in tithes and offerings? You got to wonder sometimes whether you say you abhor idols, but then you won't honor the things of God. And you hold on to it. And I've seen people make an idol out of money, like it's going to serve, like it's going to deliver them, like it's going to be their thing. But I'm still meditating on it, so I don't want to get too deep into it. In verse 23, and this is where I, th- I want to kind of center up on as we move along. You who boast in the law, and I'd like to, to kind of paraphrase that a little bit. What about this? You who boast in the word. I understand that he's making a differentiation between law and grace and things throughout this book, but he's also making a distinction that people who say they have the answer, right? If you go back, he's talking about with the Jews. They have the answer. They have the oracles of God. You say you have the answer, but you don't live by the answer you say you have. Are you, are you with me? Now, he says, you who boast in the law, do you, do, you dis, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? And then he quotes a verse. He says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, Here's the interesting thing, and I, 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 was, as I, I was meditating on this for a couple of days, and I, I just had the opportunity to attend some of Andrew Womack's meetings in Texas, and there's a woman that he brought up on stage to give a testimony, and she, she, had, she uh, was going to Bible school. While she's there in Bible school, she was out partying a lot and drinking, getting drunk, going to all these things, and you know, because she thought, well, I, I mean... From what somebody told me, she thought she's under grace, so it really doesn't make any difference. So she's, uh, she's at a, which Andrew does not believe, I can tell you is a fact that that's true of him. And so we're, she's sitting at a bar one night, and she's talking to this woman, and this woman's saying, well, so why are you in Colorado? And she's trying to get around the answer, and trying to get around the answer. And finally, she just she corners her and says, no, seriously, what, what are you doing here in Colorado? And she finally, she looks at the woman and says, I'm, I'm here in Bible school. And the woman looked at her, looked at her beer, looked back at her, and she said, the look on her face challenged me to my core, I think is what, what she said. Because she realized that even this person sitting in this bar realized these two should not be married like that. Now, I don't condemn anybody for anything. I'm just not into that. But we do, I think it's interesting when he's making this point, this is not about the curse of the law. This is not about your actions invoking a curse. This is not about your actions um, uh, causing God to love you. This is not about God's, your actions causing God to bless you. You know, legalism really, uh, I, I define legalism as this. Anything I'm doing to get God to love me, anything I'm doing to get God to accept me, anything I'm doing to get God to bless me, if I'm doing what I'm doing for any of those three things, it's legalism. But on the other side of it, I can still be doing things. Uh, let me give you an example with the power of words. If I'm confessing the Word of God and speaking the Word out of my mouth, and, and somebody said, well, you, that's legalism. No, it isn't. It's the way the kingdom of God operates. Now, if I was saying I can make it legalism simply by saying that I'm confessing this to get God to bless me. I'm doing this to get God to help me. You do that? Yes, that's legalism. But if you're doing it because you have been blessed, if you're doing it because you have authority, if you're doing it because Jesus has purchased for something for you, and so you're laying hold of it by the authority of the believer, that is not legalism. No, that's the way it ought to be. 
We, our, our belief should create actions. But understand, you can confess anything you want to, and it's not going to cause God to bless you, because you're already blessed. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God has already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness, that you walk in it through precious promises. You still have to obtain the promises, but when you put the promises into play, you're not trying to convince God to help you. No, He was already convinced to help you. How do you know that? Because He gave you a promise. And so you can invoke the pro promises legalistically or you can invoke them in faith, which is what our father Abraham did. But you cannot, not, if you have no actions, you actually don't believe anything because belief, faith causes action. If you believe in the power of words, you use the, uh, to, in, in the Old Testament they said it like this, those that love the power of the tongue will eat the fruit thereof. If they love it, if they believe it, life and death is in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will eat its fruit, right? So if once you begin to realize the power that you have in your tongue, and if you love it, you'll put it into practice. That's not legalism. That's actually functioning in the kingdom. Now, but here's the thing. This, I don't know how I got off on that. But here's the thing of it is, is that He's not addressing any of that. He's not addressing God blessing you. He's not addressing God loving you. He's not addressing any of that. What he's saying is, is your actions are being a bad reflection on the Lord. The Gentiles are able to blaspheme God because of what you do. Now, I think that we don't take this seriously enough. You know, for years, I, I think I've kind of said it like this. Your actions will not save you, but they could save someone else. Because you will either be an excuse to believe, or you'll be an excuse not to believe. Because there'll either be, there'll be somebody that's watching you that will either be able to say, I never could get around the fact I saw the genuine article. Or they're going to say, I don't believe all that stuff. I know so-and-so. They go to church every day. They pray over their food. They do all that. And I know for a fact this is the way they run around and how they live their life. And now you're an excuse not to believe. Now, let me be clear. All of us, at some point or another, myself included, are going to have an action that doesn't line up with what you believe. You will be a hypocrite from time to time. You will believe something and you won't live by it, and that is hypocrisy, okay? But you don't stay there, and you don't make a lifestyle out of it, and you don't make an excuse for it. At the very least, if you're acting against what you believe, at least say, yeah, yeah I believe this, but I don't do it. I, and listen, I, I am chiefest among sinners where this is concerned, in particular in dealing with people. There are, uh, I, I've, you know, there's things that have happened in other churches where ministers that are underneath us, I tell them, don't put up with that. You need to nip that in the bud. This is how you need to handle it. They do exactly what I say. It turns out right. Problem is, I have the exact same problem in my church. And I sit there and I say, well, you know what? I'm going to give them a sub slack. I'll, I'll see if this doesn't turn out. I'll go ahead and deal with it. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I know the Lord will look after me. That's hypocrisy. I'm not saying I'm right. Are, are you with me? And, but we need to limit that. And when we're not doing it, we need to be honest about it. The minute you begin to make a justification for it is when you are trapped in it. And you are in self-deception. Are you here? Now, I just gave you an example. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm working on it. And obviously, I'm dealing with it because I wouldn't be standing up in front of all y'all and all the people around the world that are watching this talking about it if I wasn't planning on doing something about it. But you can't hide from it. You've got, but we do need to understand how our actions are affecting other people. How they're and how they can affect other people. How if I don't walk this out, 
And you know, sometimes it just is something you realize that's going to require you to repent more often to others. I acted in a way I didn't believe. I apologize for that. I repent. It's not how I believe. I shouldn't have done it that way. That's not how Jesus acts. And if it's not how Jesus acts, it's not the way I'm supposed to act. I acted contrary to Jesus. I just want it to be clear between you and I. That is not who Jesus is. And I repent for representing him in the wrong way to you. Why? Well, people can respect that a whole lot more. Not only that, you begin to show them a genuine article that we don't have to be perfect to start serving God. That we can start serving God today. We can have issues and stuff that we're all working out, but we can still understand that Jesus loves us, and we can still keep moving forward. Now, uh, here's something, though, that I want to kind of go in a a little bit different way, that in breaking the law or breaking the word, violating the word that we're teaching. And this might get a little bit uh, tense here for a second. Um, But I was having a conversation with a nationally known minister yesterday in the car, and this kind of struck me, and I saw how it applied to this verse. What happens when you become silent in the face of people saying wrong things about God. Um, now, I, I'll tell you, I, I have a, um, I, I was training with a friend of mine, and he's one of, he, he's literally probably, he's one of the top three guys in the world in executive protection. He's probably, he is, he is the best knife guy in the United States. He's, I mean, he's all that and a bag of chips and more. And um, we were training together. We're friends. And, and um, all of a sudden, he took the Lord's name in vain. Now, he'd been cussing like a sailor up to this point, but we hadn't gotten there yet. And I hadn't said anything. Because everybody's working th- some things out. I'm not going to get offended by somebody else's speech. They, they can say whatever they want to say, except when it comes to this. And he took the Lord's name in vain, and I said, um, I stopped and I said, bro, I need to talk to you a second. I said, you know, I, I love you. I wouldn't talk about your family ugly. I don't want you talking about my family ugly. And he looks at me, and he said, and he, because he, he's smart, he said, I, I, I I, I didn't mean to say that. I, I would mean no disrespect. And he starts apologizing, asking me to forgive him. I, listen, I said, I, I just, I think, I, he said, I, I, you just need to understand I've already accepted I'm going to hell. And this is what I'm trying to reach him. I, I love him. I, th- I think I, he's, he's a good man. And I'm trying to, given his life, for our, he hadn't died, but he's served our country. And, um, and I said, well, the problem is, is it's just not true. Because God does not damn anyone. That's not true of him. That's not who he is. People go to hell because they choose to. If you end up in, if you end up in hell, you'll end up there because you chose to. You don't have to. But I'm believing for better things for you. Now, here's the thing. I have come to the conclusion that if I remain silent then I'm allowing the name of God to be blasphemed because I'm not standing up saying, that is not who he is. That's not who he is. And you're not going to say that about him. You want to use F-bombs, you want to do all this other stuff, that's between you and him. But once you begin to talk about him and begin to lie against him, begin to infer things about him, I can, I'm going to stand up because I will not allow you to say things about him that are not true. You know, and, and now everybody would agree with what I just said. But what happens when you hear stuff like, and this actually was one of the things we were discussing yesterday in the car. What happens when you're at a funeral and somebody said, God took this child? No, he didn't. Didn't have anything to do with it. We were talking about a friend of mine, 
there were some people in our church that had a young girl, and we'd been ministering to them for a while, and um, at some point, the little girl died. And at first, they asked me to do the funeral, and the Lord had told me they were asking me, he'd already told me, they're going to ask you to do the funeral, but you won't end up doing the funeral. And I said, all right, so we're there the night she dies. We, we drive there, we're a couple hours away. We go down, we sit down with them, and we're uh, talking to them. And they said, would you do the funeral? Yes, I will. And I'd already told Terry, I said, now, I'm not going to end up doing the funeral. I know we said we were going to, but I'm not going to end up doing the funeral. I don't know why, but I'm not. So they called back in two, days, two days later and said, no, we're going to allow this other person to do the funeral but we want you to come up at the end and speak. And I said, I'm asking you not to do that. Actually, I think I might have said, I'm begging you. Please don't. Please don't do that. I said, because I don't know this person. I don't know what they're going to say. And if they say something that violates the Lord, and you hand me a microphone... I will not let it pass. Not for you, not for those people, because I owe him more than I owe anyone else. Now, actually, I repent. I didn't tell, him, I didn't tell them that at that moment, because this kind of goes on. I said, I, I, I beg you, please don't do this. I, I don't know it'll be fine. We know what you believe. We know what you stand for. And I said, I, am, I really, 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 really think this is a bad idea. No, no, we want it. We want it. We want it. Okay, so they have the funeral, and this bozo gets up there, and from the very start, I think his, what, his first words were, I don't know why God did this, and so I know this isn't going good, and he, start, he said, I, you know, in times like this, you don't know what to say, and then he keeps talking, which is, you know, we should learn, if you don't know what to say, just shut up. And, and, you know, if you don't have the answer, just say, I don't have the answer. Let it be done. But that was the beginning of the service. And he just goes on and on about the Lord and about how the Lord probably saw down and took her and she accomplished this. And the girl's, what, 12 years old, 13 years old? Now, her brothers and sisters are sitting there in this service hearing that the Lord did this. And now, those of you who don't know, Ted Turner, I, I assume he's still a devout atheist, and one of the reasons he's a devout atheist is, is because his sister died, and they told him, the Lord took your sister, and he said, if that's the way he is, I hate him. So, at the end of the service, they said, we'd like to ask Pastor Kurt to come forward now. And, I mean, there's quite a few people there. And they hand me the microphone. And I have a choice to make. I can allow the name of God to be blasphemed by me doing nothing. By me just sitting there. I can play nice-nice. I can walk out of here and everybody think I'm wonderful. Or I can walk out of here and be probably the most hated person that they've ever heard at a funeral. So they give me the microphone, and um, I, the family comes forward. I'm supposed to pray over them. And I started off like this. I said, I want to be clear from the start. God had absolutely nothing to do with this, that he was doing everything he could to save. And I said, if in the future, I said, I do not know why this happened. And I said, which I repent to you that I don't know enough because I know this isn't God. But if in the future... I learned something that it, if I'd have known it right now that would have saved your daughter. I repent to you that I don't know it now. And then I knelt down and said to the kids, Jesus did not take your sister. 
He received her. And he loved her. But he didn't do this. Now, there was more things that were said. I prayed over the family. And it caused no small stir. And um, we went out. We stayed to eat, which there was really no reason to because nobody spoke to us, not even the family. Jimmy spoke to us. He was there. Um, They avoided us like, you know, we were the plague. And um, so a couple days later, the father calls me and says, can I meet with you? And I drove down to Palm Beach to meet with him. We're sitting there, and he goes, I want to know why you did what you did. And I started crying, and I said, I begged you not to ask me. I told you. And I said, as much as I love you, I don't owe you anything. I owe the Lord everything. And I could not, will not, allow that to continue. And I don't know that we've spoken since that day. But see, here's the thing. There's more going on in the earth today, and people are calling it God. And a lot of times the church is just sitting idly by, and ministers are not saying that, no, this is... You know, people always want to say, well, you, you, you're immoral, you're, because now they're calling people who believe the Bible intolerant. No, we're not intolerant. We're extreme. We, we love you. We're just not willing to say what you're doing is right. But at some point, we're going to have to stand up and say, I am not blaspheming God by going along with you. I am not allowing you to say that God is accepting of this. You know, I, it, God, you know it's funny because how people come up with stuff, and they just make stuff up, really, because they just come up because they want it to be that way. I remember when uh, on US1, there was a, a billboard that said Jesus is a veg- was a vegetarian. And it had him sitting there, one of those old religious pictures, and then it had an orange piece, orange slice behind his head instead of a halo. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, he wasn't. <laughs> because I can think of a couple barbecues he had. And, um, and so I, they had a website, and so I, I went to the website, and they said, though we cannot prove this by Scripture, we know God that Jesus regarded animals higher than this. Listen, if you can't prove it by Scripture, it's not true. I mean, honestly, probably Jesus is the responsible for the death of more fish during that period of time because he commanded them all to get into Peter and John's net, and they all did it, right? He didn't say, we can't hurt the fish, you know. Sorry, Pete, you should, never should have been fishing anyway. Come on now. He never did that. And see, people are trying to say, you know, that Jesus was tolerant. Jesus was not tolerant. You're not tolerant if you look at people and say, you are a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. You are of your father, the devil. I mean, that's, you know, I don't know that you could go much further than that. Right? And you're standing there saying, they're standing there saying, we're the children of Abraham. And he looks at them and says, You're no more the children of Abraham than a goose is an astronaut. That rock is more of a child of Abraham than you are. You don't believe. Well, you know, and notice he did not allow them to self-identify as children of Abraham. Oh, no, no, you can't self-identify. No, no, you either is or you isn't. Right? Right? You're either of the faith of Abraham or you're not. With the woman, you know, I love to teach on the love and the compassion that he had for the woman caught in adultery. But you you know, he was not tolerant of that because when it was over, (laughs) he said, just live whatever way you want to. We love you. No, it was go. No, go and sin no more. Lest a worse thing come upon you. He was not tolerant. His... Peter, his number one guy, tries to explain to him, I don't want you to die. 
You'd think that that was a loving message. And Jesus looks at him and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, because you're mindful of the things of men and not the things of God. That is not a tolerant statement. It is not a tolerant statement when you look at a man who just walked on water but sunk. You get back in the boat and you look at the guy that walked on water farther than anyone else except for yourself and you look at him and says, what's the matter with you, buddy? Why, don't you have, why didn't you have any faith? You know, people, you know, he would be on the news today. Because people would be saying, he is cruel. This man walked as far as he could on the water. Yes, he ran into some problems, but he should have loved him regardless. Jesus, you should have sandwiched that. You should have commended him for at least getting out of the boat. He did better than the rest of them. You should have maybe corrected him a little bit, but then come back in and said, but at least you tried. No, it wasn't enough that he tried. It wasn't enough that he walked on water. He did what none of the other disciples did. He walks on water, but when he took his eyes off Jesus, when he got it wrong, Jesus didn't applaud his effort and say, Bravo, at least you did more than anybody else. It's no, no, what's the matter with you? Why didn't you believe? When they were afraid of the storm, he did not sit there and say, I understand, guys, these things can be spooky, especially out here on the lake. Let's just sit around, let me love you. And he's like, what's the matter with you? Why is it that you have no faith? I don't see a lot of, well, kumbaya moments. You know, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I love you. No, I love you, dude, but I want you to get it right. I want you to walk further. I want you to do what I'm teaching you. When I tell you that you can speak to mountains, I want you to start speaking to mountains. I don't want you being amazed when I do it. They marvel. You know, it says that you got to the boat. Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? He's the same dude that cursed trees and did what they told him to do. He's the same one that ever, when he spoke, creation answered and then said, you speak to the creation and it'll do what you tell it to do. Amen. And see, we as ministers, we need to start living the messages that we preach. Yes. But quit saying, when people want to come up with stuff about the Lord that we know is not true, let's say, no. No, that's not right. No, that's not who He is. No, He does not accept this. You know, it's just like, I told somebody one time, they said, well, Jesus accepts you just as you are. I said, mm, no, He doesn't. He accepts you in spite of the way you are. That's a truer statement. You want to know how I know that? Because as soon as he, he accept, when he accepted me with all my problems, he didn't say, okay, I never expect you to grow and change. Just continue on the way you are. Because if he accepted me just the way I was, he would have never spoke about change. But we've been talking about change since the day we met. If I accept you just as the way you are, I never ask you to change. Never ask you to do anything. I can accept you in spite of the way you are. And then begin to help you to change. I can love you past your sin. I can love you past your mistakes. Or, and that's who Jesus is. I know who you are. I love you anyway. I'm not planning on letting you stay the way you are. But <laughs> I love you. And see, we need to start standing up for things. When people say stuff, and they say that, you know, we're evil because we stand for righteousness, say, no, excuse me, excuse me. I know you're saying that, but let me explain to you. You're the one that's evil. And I can tell that by the fact that you're speaking against the things that God says are important. He's good, you're not. And I make and make no apologies. And understand, 
they're going to attack you, and you'll probably be a social media poster child. But the thing of it is, is you just need to understand is this, I just don't care. I, I'm going to hold my loyalty to the Lord and to none other. I don't owe anyone else anything but Him. I owe Him everything. And by the way, I, way I say that, because I've had people do good things for me. But if you ever make me choose between you and Him, it doesn't matter what you've done. It, it, it's nothing compared to what He's done. Nothing. And we need to quit allowing the name of God to be blasphemed. Standing up and saying these things, the, the, the things that are right, that there is a right and there is a wrong, and we make no apology for it. And that we're not against anybody, we don't hate anybody, but we're not necessarily going to go along and say what you're doing is right in any way. And, and we need to do this as ministers because sometimes we kind of soft-soak stuff trying to placate, and I believe there's a way that you could, you know, I, I think we ought to take the tack that Paul did. Paul, when Paul walked in uh, to Corinth and they were worshiping a bunch of idols, he started off with, um, I, I see in all things you are most religious. I saw that you had a statue to the unknown God. Let me tell you about this God whom you worship, but you don't know. I think there's a time that you have to bridge things like that. Because I think he wouldn't have been able to reach those people if he walked in and said, you bunch of backslidden, bunch of idol worshipers, you need to get right with God, you bunch of devil-worshiping heathens. I don't think that would have worked, because if that was the thing to go, he'd have gone with that. But he took them, he met them at a place, and then took them further. He didn't leave them there. This is a God that cannot be worshipped with that which is made with hands. Are, are you with me? And see, we need to, we need to begin to... We, we need to stand for what we stand for, never back off of it, but find a way to relate it to people in love, but never compromise truth. It's like a friend of mine asked me one time, he said... Um, it was Christmas, and I brought him a Christmas gift. And he said, well, you know I'm not a Christian. I said, yeah. He said, I've always wanted to ask you this. He said, uh, I'm, you, you think people like me are going to hell? And I said, no, I don't think that. I said, I, I know that. I know, I know you're going to hell. If you were to die, you know, I, I said, I'm, I'm praying that you not go. And I love you, and I'll do anything that would help you. But yeah, if you died, you're going to hell. The only way to get to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he looks at me, and he says, well, you, 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 you don't treat me. I said, no, I'm not against you. I love you. I'm believing you're going to go to heaven. But understand where you're at right now. No, it, it's not happening. Did I tell him the truth? Yes. Was I loving about it? I thought so. He might not have liked what I said, but it didn't change the fact that it was true. You know, one of the problems is, is that when you get the... <laughs> I wish they'd put some of the normal people on television, the normal Christians. Because it seems to me sometimes some of the people Christians they put on TV, they try to find the craziest people you've ever seen in your life and put them on TV where they're just almost frothing at the mouth going wild at stuff. Because there, there is a way to say, listen... I don't agree with what you're doing. I love you anyway. But what you're doing isn't right. There is a way to walk that out. And we need to walk in that. But we have to become where we refuse to accept wrong. We won't just go along with it. Not in our own lives. To examining our lives saying, you know what? This is not right. And, you know, some things people do in secret. And, you know, if anybody ever found out, it would harm your witness. You need to get it straightened out while it's in secret so it doesn't end up harming your witness. So that if anybody ever else does find out, you can at least say, you know, yes, I struggled in the past, but I came out of it. The Lord delivered me. But I, I you know, it's been, you know, X, however long it was. Get it. 
Get it worked out. And if you need help, understand, you can call us anytime. We're not going to judge you, and we're not going to be against you. I'd much rather you sit there and say, hey, I'm having this problem. I'm dealing with this, and, you know, I'm in sin. Okay, great. That's a good place to start. We can get you out of the darkness until the day that it gets found out, and I have to show up because you're too ashamed. You don't want to see anybody. And I have to come knocking on your door and ask you questions, see if I can talk to you and get you restored. Much better for you to come before then and get it worked out. And I'm not going to judge you either way because there but for the grace of God go I. And I believe in restoration. We that are spiritual restore. We don't condemn. We don't bury. Are you all with me? Now, I, I want to look at uh, one other thing. You know what, I, th- I think I'm going to end up preaching on some of this next time too. Somebody's going to have to remind me. But um, go with me to uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Wow, I'm, I know I'm going to have to teach on some of this next time because... He says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Oh, 3.1. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. You know, um, well, let me get back to this. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. Without self-control, brooder, uh, excuse me, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pr- pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, from such people turn away. Once again, not very tolerant of this behavior. <laughs> um, let me ask you this as ministers. Because a lot of times when we read these verses, it's like a warning on society. And if you ever read it in the Passion Translation, it's a pretty big warning on society. And maybe we'll get into that next, next time. But what about this? I can see in here a lot of things that ministers are guilty of. And a lot of times, to be honest with you, there's things in this list that either have caused them to fall or when I talk to them, they're laying hold of these things and the reason they're not going on with ministry. Now, um, what about unthankful? I, 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 I'm going to go through the list at some point. What about unthankful? Uh, okay, here's another. Honestly, I would not be in the place that I am today without Terry in, in, in this regard. Because my wife... Change, and, and I guess truly Andrew uh, helped me get over this, was the fact that in my calling, I was unthankful for my calling. Extremely so. My attitude was, is I have to do this. And my wife kept saying, every time I said, I've, I have to go here. She says, no, nope, that's not true. You get to go there. The Lord honored you enough to ask you to go. You don't have to. You get to. Are you are all? Because there's times in ministry we're like, oh, I got to do this, I got to do this. No. God honored you and chose you. He asked you to do this. And really, th- this can be anywhere from helps up to preaching to multitudes. I mean, Ananias that we really only have one scripture of is like, hey, uh, you got a second? Could you go over there and lay hands on Paul, get him baptized in the Holy Ghost? I mean, evidently he's cleaning and doing some stuff, and yet that man changes the, the whole, really, the course of human history by going over there, being willing to lay hands on Paul, get him baptized in the Holy Ghost, get those scales off his eyes. That's awesome. 
And, it, and, you know, even though he was a little resistant at first, I mean, which I had to be honest, I would have been too. I mean, I thought it was kind of funny because he's basically said, Jesus, do you really know this guy very well? Because uh, let me tell you, and he's like, oh, yeah, I know all about it. It's going to be fine. I've heard about him. I, I love that relationship that a man has with God. You want me to do what? I've heard about this guy. You know what he's been doing, don't you? Yeah, I know. I know. It's okay. That is a great relationship with the Lord. You know, and he's not even one of the, the big 12, you know, the, the, the apostles of the Lamb. He's, not one, he's just a guy that ended up changing the course of the church by laying hands on Paul. But you, if, when you become unthankful in ministry, that you're not thankful for what the Lord has asked you to do, it'll corrupt you. I can tell you that because it has corrupted me in the past. There's times even to this day that I've had before a service, and I'm fi- trying to figure out why I'm here, and I lay down, and I sit there, and I say, Lord, I thank you for asking me to do this. Lord, I thank you for asking me to do this. You don't know how many times I've had to get, because since Terry started dealing with me, and the Lord started dealing with me about this, I'd be sitting in an airport and having to fly out somewhere and not really wanting to go in my flesh and sitting there and say, Lord, I thank you. You could have asked anybody else, but you asked me. You know, it's funny because... We, we go to, I have to go to France, and I'm in Paris at least twice a year. Now, obviously, I'm not really a tourist, because unless my wife's with me, I really don't see anything. But um, I, I know people that have never... I, I said, oh, you've been to Paris? Oh, I've always wanted to go to Paris. And here I am. I go twice a year. Now, I can sit here and have the attitude... Th- these people would love to do it, and I'm acting like it's a drudgery. Oh, my goodness, i got to go back to Paris. That's not, and I understand I don't go see the Eiffel Tower and hang out with the Mona Lisa and all that other stuff. That, I know that's not, that's not my thing. But I get to do things that nobody else seems, a lot of times gets to do. And I've been privileged and you should be thankful for those things. Now I'm talking about this, but what is it he's asked you to do? Who are the lives you've seen changed? That you, that you need to be thankful that you got to speak that word. You got to pray that prayer. You got to be there, whether it was to 10,000 or to 10. Either way, God thought enough about you to ask you to represent him personally to do this. There is something to be thankful for. Now, one of, and I, and oh, wow, I got to close. But there's one other one I want to look at because I think there's a misunderstanding of this. And hopefully, if the Lord allows, I'll go back to this next month. But the one after unthankful, unholy. Now, this is interesting because when people start talking about holiness and about being unholy, a lot of times the reverse, and I actually saw some of the translations, it said ungodly, but it's actually not, doesn't say ungodly, it says unholy. Now, the opposite of, unhol- uh, of holiness is not ungodliness. The opposite of holiness is commonness. This is holy. This isn't. This does, it doesn't mean that this is ungodly. It's just common. This is consecrated, separated, sanctified, offered to God. This isn't. It's common. And you know, too often we as ministers, they're, they're, and, and understand I'm not speaking against godliness. I think we need to operate in godliness. But sometimes we just behave too commonly. We seek to... We need to be all things to all people, but that does not mean we become common. Now think about this. If you have a relationship with the Lord that no one has ever witnessed before, and they see that in you, that is because it is uncommon, because you are holy before the Lord. You have set aside time. You have set aside your life. You have set aside your thoughts, your ambitions, your ideas to Him because you are consecrated to the Lord. You're not common. I don't take my life commonly. I'm not trying to be common. Well, we just want to be like everybody else. No, we do not because we are holy. We are sanctified, set aside 
to the Lord. We are not like everyone else. You know, I was addressing this on the radio. It'll hit the radio, I don't know, uh, seven or eight weeks, I guess. Or No, it'll be, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, the fact that people say this all the time, well, we're, all, uh, we're all God's children. No, we're not. That's a lie. We are not all God's children. Nope. Because Jesus himself made a distinction. Paul makes a distinction. There are children of the devil and there are children of God. And the way you become a child of God is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not a child of God. I don't care what you say. That's the reason John says, to those that believed on him, to them he gave the right, the power, the ability, the privilege to become a child of God. It means it's not automatic. Just being born doesn't make you a child of God. Now, here's the thing. Once you realize that you are part of the royal family, that you are now no longer common to the world, but now you've been made holy. And this is a tremendous distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you had to act right to be holy. In the New Testament, you've been made holy, now act right. But you, don't, you do not give yourself to commonness. You're not going to behave like the common people. Because you are not common. You are not going to act like people who do not know God. Do not have access to the throne. Do not... You know, all these people talk about we've been barred in the gates of heaven. I don't spend any time at the gate at all. I'm already seated there. There is no sense in me spending any time at the gate. I'm already seated on the throne with him. I don't, ha- I don't even base- waste any time on the outside. I've been brought into the intimate place. So why do I act like a commoner and beat on the gate? Why do I act, you know, the angel, we're the only person, in, we are the only creature in existence that can sit in the presence of God. Everybody else stands, bows, or flies. You, you are allowed to sit with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are not common. So don't give yourself to common things. Well, this is the common cold. Well, then it's not mine. I'm not common. This is flu season. Yes, I understand that. The commoners have flu season. But I am not common. I've been made holy. I've been separated unto God. Now, I want to make another distinction. In this royal family, we treat the common people very well. We do not look down our nose. We serve in hopes that they will make a choice to not be common anymore. We show them by our thoughts, our words, and our deeds what it is like to be sanctified and separated unto God, to be holy and to be uncommon. We demonstrate that through our service. We demonstrate through the power that we display and utilize on their behalf. By the laying on of hands. By the utilizing of the name of Jesus. That you have access to unprecedented power. That they just don't, can't get to. Because there's only one way in. But you are not common. And you do not try to be common. You know, ultimately... I I understand what Paul was saying when he said, you know, let's become all things to all people. But he immediately, when he tried to reach them where he was at, he switched it on them and tried to get them to be like him. I want you to be like me. Right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach you where you are. I'm gonna come down to your level, but very very as quickly as I could. I want you to be like me. I want you to come out of commonness. You know, a lot of times when we talk about unholy, we can, 
we can, um, you know, we, we can each come up with a list of what we think is unholy, but ultimately you've got to get down to, well, are you behaving just like you're common, like it doesn't matter? Uh, let me give you an example. What about spending time intimately with God? That is an uncommon thing. It killed people in the Old Testament. If, you, if they tried to do what you do so freely, it would have killed them. God lives on the inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit demonstrated himself in the Old Testament, folks died. They encountered that glory, and there, if there was no blood, you didn't make it. You touched that ark. And you weren't supposed to. You dropped dead. It didn't matter whether you were trying to do it for good or for bad. You touched that ark in the wrong way. It's over. They're shipping your saddle home. Now today, if, if the ark were to be here, you could go up, sit on it, touch it. Because the present, you, you could play backgammon on it if you wanted to. It wouldn't make any difference because the presence that once dwelt there now dwells in you. You, that's, you are no longer common. That's not who you are. And we shouldn't treat that lightly as though we can just walk around and it really doesn't matter what we do. Oh, yes, it does because we are no longer common. We have been made holy. That when, with our relationship with God and our opportunity to go into the throne room to fellowship. And the old, you know, and this is the thing that annoys the sap out of me about some of this, the stuff that they do with, um, when they try to make Christians and they, they don't want us to use the name of God because, you know, in, with the Jews, they can't even, they don't write God. They write G-D because they can't say it because it's too holy. And yet we're said we're called by His name. That's our name, right? We're a part of the family of God. Now think about it. Back then they couldn't even say his name. And he says, oh, not only can you say it, I'll give you, I'm giving you my name. You're going to be called by that name too. That's what Ephesians chapter 3 says. When we begin to honor that, it's like, well, wait a minute. I'm not just nobody. It actually matters how I spend my time. Me blowing off time with God is unholy because that is a common practice not to be able to come into the presence of God. But now I've been made uncommon and I can come into the presence of God and therefore holiness for me is walking into the presence of God. Not just because it's God, it's because no common person can do this. So why do I throw it aside? Why don't I major on that? Why don't, I've been given this uncommon privilege. Why would I teach, treat this uncommon privilege commonly? Right? You, you do realize in the Old Testament, it says that they, they would have done anything to be able to see and to, and to do what we can do. And yet, sometimes we just act like it's no big deal. That is unholiness. That's unholiness. You know, we think if you know, we were to go to strip club tonight, that would be unholy. It's unholy with the minute you take something, is being able to have a personal, intimate relationship with God and treat it as though it's no big deal. That is unholy because that is treating it like it's common. And see, there's things that... You know, what about this? What about reading the Word and understanding it? Because there are lots of people who read the Word and don't understand it. You know, I, I remember before I got saved, the year before I got saved, my mother gave me a Bible. I read the Bible. And I said, there's, I can see there's some wisdom in there, just like there is in Sun Tzu, and just like there is in this. But, you know, and it's a pretty good history book. Got some stuff in there, but really, it's not that significant. Year later, I meet Jesus, and now my entire life is wrapped up in the book, and now things that didn't seem to be that big of a deal to me have changed my life forever because I didn't understand it, because I was common, and then I be, it was given an uncommon privilege but to have Almighty God come and live on the inside of me to instruct me, to teach me. 
to open the eyes of my understanding. And yet sometimes we can't get Christians to get in their Bible even though they believe it to be the Word of God because they treat it as a common thing. And it's not common. It is not common to be able to read the Word and have the Lord explain to you what He said. It is a privilege. It is an honor. Now on the other side of it, it should become a common practice you know, we should get to the place, I, I think it's in, in, interesting in the Bible, where it talks about Paul with the handkerchiefs, where he says that extraordinary miracles were done by the hands of Paul. That's an interesting statement, because most of the time people would think that miracles in and of themselves were extraordinary. You understand what I'm talking about? But it specifically says, let, let's actually split the words to make it a little bit easier Extraordinary miracles. Beyond ordinary. In other words, in their everyday life, there were ordinary miracles. And so they needed to make distinction when it came to Paul. Because they wanted to say there are extraordinary miracles. So there should become a day to which you need to understand because you are no longer common, because Jesus lives on the inside of you, that miracles become an ordinary practice. Doesn't mean we treat them lightly. Doesn't mean we treat them as common. We still honor them. But it should be ordinary for you to operate in the miraculous. To the point that it really has to stretch it a little bit. Say, well... You know, we have miracles every day, but that, that right there, that was really something right there. That was extraordinary. Think about it now. You know, we, we act like, you know, if somebody... It's interesting in life of Smith Wigglesworth, I've always wondered what it would be like to have Smith around today with television. Because now today, and, and I understand why we do it, and I'm not despising it. In fact, I'm sure we'll do it with KOM, and we already have. Where we, we you know, if somebody has a miracle, we feature it. Right? We take pictures of it, and that's good. That's great. Because we, we're trying to inspire people. We're trying to remind people this is still operating and stuff. But Smith, I think, I think it was hilarious that they had a, a, a healing line, and this happened more than once, where he would hit somebody, slap somebody, and then they would think they were dead. And then he would be continue ministering down the line. And then all of a sudden, one case, they thought that the man was on a stretcher. They thought he'd killed him and because he punched him in the stomach and the man had stomach cancer. And the guy just flatlined, right? there. He just out. And they're like, you killed him. The doctors, the doctors that brought him, like, you killed him. And he's like, he ain't dead. He's ailed because he was Welsh. He's ailed. And so he starts going down like a stretcher case. It was near death. And he's going down the line and he's ministering to somebody else. All of a sudden, the guy jumps up, running around the building. Smith never turned around. He just said, give God all the glory for it, brother. And just kept ministering. Because that was ordinary to him. That is what's supposed to happen. That is the expectation. You're going to have to go a while before you get me to turn around and go, wow, my, that's something. And we need to get to the place that we do not treat the privileges that we have as common, but they do become commonplace in our lives. We pray, we are answered. We lay hands, they recover. We speak, it changes. It's not mystifying. That's actually what's supposed to happen. I don't take it for granted. I treat it as an honor. I'm, I'm exceptionally honored to be a member of the royal family. I do not treat the privilege of being able to speak to God at any time for any reason. Being called by His name, I do not treat it as common. But it is commonplace that I'm able to speak to my Father and my Father to speak to me. It is commonplace to be able to operate in the power of God. But we need to run from unholiness, not from 
strip clubs and stuff, but from just the fact of trying to be like everyone else, trying to be common. No, it's not that way. I don't need to fit in because I don't. I am not like everyone else. I'm a member of the royal family of heaven. And I make no excuse for it. And if the ministers would see this, if we would begin to live this, if we would begin to identify with our family, and that when they begin to speak against God, it, it's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. You're, you're talking about my family. You're talking about the one that died for me. You're talking about the one that gave everything. No, I'm not going to let this pass. You're saying he's a way that he's not. Are you with me? You know, I, I can tell you this, that like if, if somebody came in and said, hey, we're going to paint the walls chartreuse, my wife would say, no, we're really not. And you'd say, why? Because my husband will never come back. He's not going to be in a building filled with chartreuse. I'm not going to do that to him. Why? Because I love him and he loves me. Can't we have that same attitude towards the Lord? No, you're not, you're not going to do that. Because that's not Him, and I love Him, and He loves me. Amen? Amen? If we would do this, it would be far easier to reach people. Because one of the reasons we're not reaching people is because is we're not steadfast in stuff. We don't have to be belligerent and ugly, but we do need to be unequivocal. And when they test you, it's funny, I was telling you about that friend of mine, and uh, I hope he's not listening, but it was funny because, so he'd been cussing a little bit before, right? But then after I challenged him on that, he was re completely repentant, by the way. He, he did not mean it, and he was, honestly, he was, he was hurt that he might have offended me. But then I did notice that he went off on a tirade of profanity for a while. And then I finally realized, there's, whether he's doing it intentionally or not, He's trying to see whether he can offend me. He's trying to see whether I'm real about this. No, I'm, you talk about my father, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with you. But out of the other stuff, I'm going to love you regardless of what you say. This is real to me. Are you with me? And people are going to try to push you. They're going to, you know, you tell somebody you love them, and they're trying to figure out whether Jesus is real or not, they're going to try to get you to not love them. They do. They try to push you. And they try to say, because they, they have seen so many phonies. They have seen so many people trying to be common. When they come against somebody who begins to deal with the uncommon, they want to know, is it finally real? Am I finally seeing the reality? Because I want it to be real. I want to give my life to this. But everybody I've met up to this point folded at some point. And I just want to know, if I'm going to commit my life to this Jesus, are you truly, is he really is real? Is there anybody who really lives this? This is the reason that during the times when they were burning Christians at stake, Nero couldn't understand that people would jump out of the, uh, out of the bleachers and run down to be eaten by lions and to die with them. Why? Because the people saw a Jesus worth dying for. They saw this is real. These people are singing while they're burning. They're fighting to be willing to die for Him. There must be something to this Jesus. But see, today, you know, we, they don't have to burn us at the stake stuff because we'll fold long before that. No, I'm going to live for Jesus. He's more important than you are, and I'm going to make sure you understand that. Because there will come a day that you're going to make Jesus the Lord of your life because you saw that He really, truly is the most important person. Right. Amen? Amen? And when they see it in the ministers, man, they'll come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for each of these, and I thank you for everybody listening to this both now and by uh, future broadcasts around the world. Lord, I thank you that you strengthen us with might through your spirit and our inner man. Lord, that we would walk worthy of the calling wherewith we were called. Lord, that not by any action that we take would we cause your name to be blasphemed. 
Lord, we know that you'll love us regardless of whatever action we do or whatever we, we do, but we don't want people going to hell. And because we love you, we don't want your name blasphemed over something we've done. And Lord, even if there's secret things, we ask you to help us to come out of it. Because Lord, we don't want to engage in any behavior that would demean you or have, uh, allow people to think ill of you. So help us. Not only that, Lord, if it's that type of behavior, it's hurting us anyway, and you don't want us to have death associated in our lives. Lord, we repent for ever teach taking any, any privilege that you've issued to us as uncommon, or as common. And Lord, we will get back to realizing how uncommon it is just to be able to speak to you, and to love you, and to hear from you, and to know and understand your word. Lord, we thank you that we will stir that back up in us, that we will not try to be like everyone else, but we will try to be like you and love everyone else and let them see you in us. And Lord, we thank you that we are grateful for our callings and we stir up gratitude beyond our feelings. And Father, we thank you that as we do this, multitudes will see you as you really are and they will come to know you as Lord Savior, Father, and Friend. And Lord, we thank you for this privilege of m making us like this. And Lord, in any way that we haven't done this, we repent and make a decision to be everything that you've called us to be and walk worthy of our calling. In Jesus' name. Lord, I also thank you that every ministry in the sound of my voice is fully supplied, spirit, soul, body, financially, and socially. And Lord, I thank you that they have more than enough to fund the gospel all over the world. And that includes us at Curto and Ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you guys. Y'all get something out of this tonight?